The next presentation that we have is um, will be from the University of Sydney, uh, and our presenters are Lean Reith and Katie Croker, and they are presenting on One Library's Journey into Supporting Text and Data Mining. Hello. Um, I'll just give Lean a moment to set up the presentation there. Um, but yes, I am Katie and that's Lean. Lean, we're seeing the notes. Just as you're setting up, a reminder to everyone um, that the Padlet can be used to ask questions of Lean and Katie at the end of their presentation. Uh, is that better? Um, yes, perfect. Yes, that's perfect. Sorry about that. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Lean Reap and I'm joined today by Katie Croker. We're from the library at the University of Sydney and we both work in academic services. Um, today we're going to talk to you about a pilot project that we did in the library to develop and deliver new services to support text and data mining, both for teaching and research, but we'll focus on the research support today. And before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land where I live and work. I'm on Gadigal land and Katie is on Wangal land. And I extend this respect to Gadigal and Wangal elders and all First Nations people joining us today. I want to note especially that collections institutions, including libraries, are valuable sources of knowledge and resources, and that we in the library have a role to play in providing access to collections with cultural competence and ethical responsibility. Um, so in today's presentation, we'll run through the background and motivations that led us to developing a library service charter for text and data mining. We'll discuss the things that we considered while developing the service, our experience delivering the services and resources, um, an unexpected partnership that popped up along the way, and details on research inquiries and how we supported those. And we'll briefly reflect on what we've learned so far and tell you a bit about what we're going to do next. So text and data mining are automated processes of selecting and analyzing large amounts of online text or data resources. And this is done to find patterns and discover relationships and meaning in and across documents and data sources. It can be used for large quantities of text and data that would be cumbersome or even impossible to work with in any other way. Data mining is usually performed on large data sets that are structured in tables or databases or in files with structured formats, such as XML files. Text mining is used on unstructured text to discover patterns and relationships. Text and data mining is not just one process, it's a range of tools and methods. And text and data mining can be used in both teaching and research. There continues to be increased interest in text and data mining across a range of disciplinary backgrounds. When we started, staff from digital collections were supporting specific researchers with text and data mining for their projects, as well as supporting academics to integrate text and data mining into their course content. This, there was a clear need for support in the university community. Companies who provide the content that the library subscribes to had also noticed an increased interest. They'd begun to create text and data mining tools to interact with their content. Gail released its Digital Scholar Lab in late 2018, and we were aware of other tools that were in development or under consideration by the other companies, ProQuest and Ithaca. Ithaca was developing a tool for JSTOR. So we had three major humanities databases exploring how they could facilitate text and data mining in their collections. Because the library is the point of discovery and access for this content, we needed to be across these tools and methods. We also have significant digital collections of our own, and we'd like to enhance the ways that users can interact with these collections. And finally, we wanted to develop a service that supports our clients in a considered way to ensure that any services or resources that we launch would be sustainable for us. 
Here's an example of one of the library's earlier projects before we trialed the service model. So in 2017 to 2018, the library worked with ProQuest, who were developing a pilot text and data mining tool. Uh, the pilot tool is shown here. Staff from Digital Collections worked with a history lecturer at the university to provide several sessions on text and data mining concepts, as well as hands-on use to undergraduate students. This proved to be a useful case study in understanding how people at the university might engage with text and data mining. We also gained insight into the skills that we would need to support them. During the classes, groups of students were asked to build a narrative of historical events using text and data mining methods. The students chose to work with data sets on specific themes that had been prepared by the project team. These data sets included gay rights in the US and indigenous rights in Australia. Pictured here is the tool for geographical analysis using one of those data sets. Based on our learnings from this and a couple of other exploratory projects, in 2019, we together a working group to deliver, to deliver, develop and trial a service charter. A working group was formed consisting of staff from Digital Collections and Academic Services. Digital Collections brought their technical and collections as data know-how, while the liaison librarians from Academic um, Services brought uh, contacts with clients as well as consideration of how our teaching and research clients could use text and data mining to improve digital and information literacy and enhance their research. Our team members have changed over time depending on availability. Um, generally we have two digital collections staff and the digital collections manager and two academic services staff who specialize in the humanities along with their manager. Extra staff have been brought on board for specific projects that require their expertise and knowledge. And since Lean recently changed roles to an object-based learning role, that should bring an interesting perspective as well to the team. Um, so as a working group, we decided a service charter was needed to define how the library could support text and data mining within the university in a sustainable way. And at the same time, we were also working on partnerships with different database providers. And next slide, yeah. So this is the service charter that we created to trial for use in the library. You can see it's tiered for different types of clients. And it was designed to leverage existing library strengths from different areas such as collection development and management and teaching um, and search strategy creation. We were aware that we are part of a wider university environment and there are other areas that are better placed to support some aspects of text and data mining, such as the informatics hub, which supplies uh, support for coding and computing. And that's an area where we really don't have the expertise to uh, offer in-depth support. So what did we provide over the course of the trial? In the research area, we provided consultations to researchers and teaching staff, giving advice on search strategies to build data sets for mining and text and data mining concepts generally. In the education space, we delivered two classes on text and data mining concepts and tools to third year level undergraduate students, one in law and the other in history. We also had a couple of requests for our slides, which enabled lecturers to reuse and deliver some of the content on their own, which makes this more sustainable for us as well. And a really important part of the project was making sure that we had good, easy to follow online content. We did a lot of work to streamline and update existing content and to identify where new material was needed. At the end of this streamlining and updating process, we had three resources, an upgrade of the existing web page about text and data mining with a very brief overview that provides a landing page that links out to all library text and data mining services and resources. And we reduced duplication and how-to content here. I moved a lot of that content into the um, text and data mining libguide, which was a new guide, which was aimed to give entry level as well as in-depth information around text and data mining, which steps through the text and data mining process. And this guide aims to provide enough understanding to enable people to decide if a method or analysis will be useful for them, as well as linking out to commonly used tools and resources such as Voyant. So that's the libguide there. And the third resource was our new text and data mining databases list. We already provided some licensing information for databases that allowed text and data mining, but we pulled all these databases together to create a new list that's created on our databases page. So the information is right there at the point of need for clients and where users might go to find their databases and materials. So this list identifies databases that are licensed for text and data mining, provides some information on how to access content for text and data mining, by linking out to resources within that resource, so their website 
um, information about their licensing and access and how to access information, uh, which can be difficult for users to find sometimes. Okay, behind the scenes, um, we did this by uh, collaborating and upskilling. And these are really key for us because this was a, such a new area for the library. It was a collaboration largely between the two library divisions of access services and where the digital collections team are located and academic services. And having these different skill sets and perspectives was really valuable in creating, promoting and delivering the service. We were able to bring queries back to the group to brainstorm and send queries to people who had expertise in the right area. We also had to upskill. Um, staff had various levels of prior experience with text and data mining and with programming. And while we didn't plan to offer programming support to clients, we felt some understanding of those skills would help us to understand clients' needs and the text and data mining process, as well as helping us to navigate the resources available. So we did a range of different programming training. Um, you can see some of the things we did. So that ranged from classes to online self-paced training. And the aim was not to become experts, but just to gain a bit more understanding about how it works. A major opportunity for upskilling came along when Ithaca approached us about being a partner institution as they developed a tool, which is now called Constellate, to analyze JSTOR and Portico content. Uh, there are tools for beginners that have a graphical interface and tools for advanced users that require extensive programming experience. Ithaca wanted Constellate to be an intermediate level tool. So once you've constructed your data set, you can analyze it. Oh, sorry. This first example is an example of term frequency. Um, it's a simple visualization that gives you a quick overview of the results of your data set. Um, so term frequency, we've got here three terms, environmental, students, and climate. And here on a graph, you can track those three terms over time, the frequency of their use over time. So that's just a visualization you get once you've started putting together your data set. Once you've constructed your data set, you can analyze it in more detail using well-documented Jupyter notebooks that step you through different analysis methods. So they're kind of pre-created uh, templates of coding that you can use and adapt to your needs. We gave feedback on usability and design and got insight into user experience. It also gave us some insights into how the availability of data would affect the kind of research that users can do. And those limitations were usually the result of copyright restrictions. We were interested to learn that most universities partnering with Ithaca had experienced coders or data scientists involved in the project. They were mostly from the US. Um, our library doesn't have any staff available to support text and data mining at such an experience level. So, it, and that's likely that a lot of local libraries, the local, local academic libraries will have comparable skill sets to ours. So we gave that feedback as well. So these are some of the research requests we got over the course of the trial from our users. And we went, not all of them fell within the scope of our service as well. Um, we got inquiries from all types of clients from honours students, postgrad students and established academics. And most of them had previous experience with text and data mining before talking to us. And most of the people who contacted, contacted us were in the humanities as well. So we had a question from an honours student who was introduced to text and data mining in undergraduate, which influenced their choice of that topic in their thesis. So it's really was a really good uh, example of how important teaching text and data mining in undergraduate is for developing future digital humanities researchers. One of the main difficulties we faced in delivering this service was getting the information necessary to provide licensing advice. It can be difficult to obtain detailed licensing information about text and data mining permissions for some databases. Even if they permit licensing activities, the ability to access content at scale may still be limited in practice. For example, even if the university has some rights for mining in a database, it is not always easy to identify exactly which sources are available and how those sources could be accessed for text mining. Um, Subscription-based databases are creating their own text and data mining tools. And while this does make the access easier, it also limits the way researchers can mine the content. They're restricted to mining content within that database's tool, and they can't necessarily combine data sets across different tools or from different sources and mine them at the same time. 
They are also limited to using the tools provided by the databases, which can differ across from database to database. And these tools are not always transparent or customizable, which can limit their usefulness for research projects. Overall, online resources have been used really well. We saw an 81% increase in traffic on the text and data mining webpage, and the guide has been accessed almost 3,800 times since its release. And we found that we had to consider both the database and the text and data mining tool when making recommendations to clients. We needed to consider which database provided the most relevant sources, as well as which tool would suit a specific client's skill level. At the end of 2020, ProQuest released their own tool, the TDM Studio, which we've also acquired. So we're going to incorporate that more into our services in a similar way to the other ones we've spoken about today. Um, it also includes newspaper content for mining, which is a common data source that people request. So we're excited to have that moving forward. We did get requests that fell outside of the service charter, which were generally about using data, data or tools that we don't subscribe to, so we can't support. Twitter was one that came up a couple of times. These requests are outside of the scope for us, but we can refer inquiries on to other people at the university who can help. This highlights a key role for the library. Uh, we're helping to connect clients to the broader network of text and data mining. Uh, this network includes training sessions. So some of the things that Katie and I and some of the other librarians accessed to learn a bit more about text and data mining, uh, support from the data scientists at the Sydney Informatics Hub. Uh, we can connect them with research groups as well as lecturers who are already teaching with text and data mining. Ultimately, at the end of the project, we got approval from library management to turn the pilot into an ongoing service. And we came up with a list of recommendations that are here on the screen. The main recommendation was to do stakeholder engagement research, which is our first priority before making any other changes. We wanted to get a better understanding of what text and data mining activities people are doing at the university, uh, where there are any gaps and barriers and what support might be needed in the future. The research will take the form of surveys and interviews with research staff and students who have different levels of experience. We'll also talk with teaching staff who are interested in including concepts and methods in their lectures, and we'll speak with professional staff around the university who provide support text and data mining. From our findings, we'll develop a full service model that ensures the support, um, the support we provide fits everyone um, and fits in with what's available around the university. We've reviewed the literature on text and data mining support, and we've noticed there isn't a lot of information on library support for text and data mining. So we're aiming to publish our results. Um, so watch this space. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Lean and Katie. What an interesting presentation. Um, there are a number of different questions on the Padlet that I'll now turn to. Uh, I'm going to start with a question that's on probably um, people's minds if they if they haven't started on a text and data mining journey. What would you recommend um, to a librarian who wants to get started with text and data mining from scratch? So perhaps working for a smaller institution that may not have as um, ha as much access to resources as at the University of Sydney. Um, I guess it. I'll start, but Lynn, feel free to jump in. Um, depends exactly what you want to, what kind of direction you want to head with that. I think in terms of training, something that I found really helpful was one of those courses we showed, the programming historian course, because it steps through a um, teaching programming, but in a way that's very linked to how researchers would be using it for text and data mining. So it kind of takes you on that programming but also text and data mining journey at the same time and that's free for everyone so it's a great resource and you've actually just answered another of the questions in the padlet which is about which of the training um, you would most recommend so programming historians a place to go yeah I thought that was a really helpful one great are there any um, open source or non-proprietary um, data mining platforms that you could recommend? Um, I can't speak this off the top of my head. I think we link to some tools on our guide, which I should put a link to in the chat, but uh, there, are, there are links out there to different tools that are helpful. Um, 
I haven't used a lot of them personally. We kind of, as I said, not experts in all of the actual analysis, but I think, yeah, that's a good place that I will link to that. A lot of the free tools seem to be um, for more advanced users, I guess, um, who are coding from scratch or from kind of basic templates. Um, in terms of for people starting out, just wanting to understand how it works, it's more the subscription tools that come with JSTOR ProPress um, that can give you kind of an introduction, like say that term frequency graph that we showed. Just doing searches and getting some kind of result to understand how, how text can be turned into data, I guess. Um, that was kind of a good threshold concept process for me was actually using those tools, but I know they're not available to everyone, unfortunately. That's one of the problems that we're having. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a great, yeah, great starting place. And Betsy Alpert's just um, said in the chat um, that the Q QUT Digital Observatory, part of broader, broader Australian Digital Observatory and the Australian Text Analytics Platform are gonna be running some training in this area in this year and we'll have a fortnightly office hours, which sounds like a really fantastic resource to use. Um, I'll just try and sneak in one more question. Um, it's about upskilling for staff. Was there any resistance from staff about upskilling in text and data mining and how much time and effort was required Required by uh, people to upskill? No, so oh, I should clarify that upskilling was that I've talked about um, was a lot mostly in the project team. So we did a lot of that programming upskilling. There was a lot of enthusiasm from the rest of the staff about text and data mining, I'd say. So we did a little bit of training based on our learnings that we shared with the rest of the library. And there was quite a lot of, um, you know, it was voluntary and people we're quite keen to attend that, I think. So I would say no, but we didn't require everyone to do all that in-depth training, which might have been a little bit, yeah, more resisted. It's definitely been uh, an approach of the text and data mining team to understand what we're doing. And something interesting that came out through the process of creating the service model was figuring out who's who's responsible for what section or for what aspect of the work based on what their specialization is. So say when we were um, working with a particular lecturer to create a like course class content, um, we asked one of the librarians who specifically supported that subject area to come on board for that project and give advice on what might be best for that course. Um, and that librarian didn't have any experience with coding uh, she was very interested in it and kind of got involved out of personal interest, uh, but really she was most valuable in terms of her subject, subject experience. Um, so there are ways of kind of being a part of the process without knowing how to code and, and knowing too much about the ins and outs of how the technical aspects work. Although if you learnt, wanted to learn more, um, it wouldn't hurt, like it would actually be really useful to know more. Oh, and just on the that kind of um, specialization aspect uh, and to go back to that earlier question about the good digital like data mining online tools, free proprietary tools. I think that that's an area that, um, that our colleagues in uh, access services who are not represented here today. So, but they really brought a lot more know-how around um, those tools and even a more back, more background knowledge in coding as well. So that was, yeah, they were really valuable just reiterate that again <laughs> so in conclusion bring together a team of people with different skills and um but high levels of interest yeah. yes yes <laughs> <laughs> great thank you so much